So in the research part of this talk, I wanted to tell you about um, the um, exciting ongoing project that we are uh, uh, we are doing with the lab of uh, Kinneret Karen uh, in uh, uh, Technion in Israel. Uh, and it's about this actomizing contraction that I showed you. Uh, the, what, ex what is exciting is that uh, there's very interesting spatial temporal uh, structure of the contraction I will show you. Um, so I want to start with um, the um, three uh, very broad examples uh, which shows you what kind of um, actomizing contraction is actually observed in cell biology. So uh, very frequent situation is the so-called steady continuous contraction. So what I'm showing here is uh, micrographs of uh, keratocyte cell, which moves on the surface. But if you are um, a, an observer sitting on top of the moving cell, what uh, you will observe is that myosin is concentrating at the rear of the cell. Uh, and uh, there's continuous steady flow from the front, right, and left into the rear of the cell. And uh, I hope the physics of it is clear from uh, the tutorial uh, that I gave. So qualitatively, it's pretty clear what's happening here. Uh, this was unraveled um, in a series of uh, very beautiful papers by uh, Julie Theriot and uh, um, Gary Borisi and uh, labs that worked, worked with uh, keratocytes. So another example is uh, when uh, actin myosin mesh uh, doesn't contract continuously and steadily, but just does what is called one-shot contraction. So contract once and that's the end of it. Uh, and the beautiful example of it is happening in, um, in the uh, oocyte that are uh, undergoing uh, meiosis. So um, normally uh, chromosomes are built into the mitotic or meiotic spindle uh, by microtubules and related motors in a very complicated process. But the uh, very cool problem is that uh, in oocytes are giant cells. They're so big that initially uh, chromosomes are scattered over a volume which is too large for a microtubule to effectively get them all. So what happens uh, is very elegant. You uh, at some point have passive uh, actin mesh and then myosin is activated and the mesh contracts. Again, along the lines that we discussed in the uh, previous half an hour. And so this one-time fishnet uh, contraction brings all the chromosomes together and allows to create the spindle. And then uh, there are uh, multiple examples of uh, repeated pulsatile actomizing contraction. For example, uh, what sometimes happens in epithelial layer, you look at this beautiful um, hexagonal lattice of epithelium, look at individual cell, and what happens is uh, actomyosin uh, at the apical surface of the cell is getting tense. Uh, then connections between actomyosin mesh and um, uh, certain adhesive uh, structures at the cell cell junctions break, and there's a pulse of contraction. The mesh contracts. Uh, but then there's turnover of myosin, uh, sort of actin and myosin. There's assembly and disassembly, and gradually the mesh is rebuilt. The um, uh, adhesions are reestablished, and the new cycle starts. And this is very important in uh, a number of developmental processes. And it's this last uh, thing that um, what, what I will show you will be uh, very relevant to actually the first and last uh, examples. So um, those are the people uh, who did uh, this work. Uh, the mathematical model I'll be showing you um, was um, created and uh, investigated by um, uh, Marsha Savinov, who is uh, a PhD student at Courant. And uh, we are uh, collaborating. I will tell you more about actually uh, experimental results than about the theory. And all the experimental results are from um, the lab of Kinneret Karen and Technion, uh, the main 
um, driver of this project is uh, Ashwini Krishna, and uh, those are um, two people who contributed at different other stages. So um, uh, what I will tell you is not published yet, but uh, you can uh, get the flavor uh, about the system by reading two published papers uh, that were published in the last couple of years. And so here's the system, it's, it's very cool. Uh, you basically take the um, cytoplasmic extract from the cell uh, and put it uh, inside uh, pretty much water. So it's not water, of course, it's just a droplet of cytoplasm immersed in uh, oil emulsion, right? And uh, those droplets are squeezed uh, between uh, glass slides. And then uh, what you see is that uh, in those droplets, actomyosin mesh uh, just spontaneously assembles and it starts contracting into the center centripetally, pretty much like uh, these equations I showed you uh, in the first half hour predicts, predicts right? Um, the beauty is that it's steady. Uh, the, the break here is that because movies, uh, unfortunately, right, it goes on for hours until all the ATP is gone. Uh, and what we see here is continuous drift, continuous diffusion, uh, assembly and disassembly. So uh, one could think like, well, well what's, what's so interesting here? Qualitative, qualitatively is clear. By the way, this dark uh, thing in the center, it's a trash patch. It's basically uh, tiny pieces of lipids, uh, some micromolecular complexes that are brought by ectomyosin and mesh to the center and just stay there. So it remarkably, it is remarkably like live cell. Uh, this trash patch is mechanically kind of like a nucleus, right? So uh, the, the simple question, well, relatively simple question that we uh, answered in uh, those previous papers is the following. So if you um, measure uh, the density of uh, this actin mesh as a function of distance from the center and uh, the velocity of this flow, of the centripetal flow, well, the density is intuitively clear, right? Uh, there's contraction to the center. So the, of course, there's peak of the density close to the center and the density decreases to the periphery. Uh, the velocity is uh, roughly, uh, has roughly linear profile, right? So it's zero at the center and then it linearly increasing away from the center. So uh, it is the so-called telescopic contraction. It's exactly like in the muscle. If you are in the center of the muscle, nothing is happening. The closer you are to the, to the ends of the muscle, the faster the contraction goes. And uh, qualitatively, this telescopic property is very simple. Can uh, connect in series uh, equal contractile elements. Well, of course, then uh, the, the more elements in series, the faster the ends connect, telescopic property. So it sounds uh, simple, but if you think about it, this is really weird, right? Because um, uh, wouldn't the contractile units uh, properties depend on density, at least on density, there's probably something else changing. But no, they, they do contract all these elementary contractile units with the same rate. Uh, by the way, um, this kind of contraction can be well characterized by this uh, parameter, which is called contraction rate K, which has uh, the unit of one, uh, uh, one over time, right? Uh, then velocity is simply contraction rate times the distance from the center. And the measured rate here is uh, uh, on the order of one uh, over minute. So it's, it roughly takes a minute for a piece of network to get from the periphery to the center, very, very human scale. So um, one can look at the um, conservation of mass equation. Uh, remember that we are in a steady situation uh, and uh, remember that we can in fact measure experimentally uh, density and velocity. And so then we can experimentally compute this term and find out what this reaction is. And turns out that the reac reaction term is remarkably simple. It is well approximated uh, by assembler, constant assembly rate minus constant disassembly rate times density. So super simple. 
assembly and disassembly are roughly constant rates. And um, the turnover rate is, of course, determined by uh, inverse disassembly rate. And turns out it's also a minute scale. So disassembly and, uh, sorry, turnover and contraction are happening on the same time. So it, the network turns over once, uh, more or less over the time it moves into the sample. Now, um, so we have mass conservation equation and we have uh, force balance equation, which I already uh, explained in the uh, previous half hour. The simplification here is that we can roughly neglect the uh, friction, viscous fri friction with surrounding fluid. I don't have time to explain why, but we have a uh, very good reason to, uh, to believe that this is true. So it's even simpler, just active stress and viscous stress. Uh, and so what we can is uh, we can write this uh, force balance equation in a spherically symmetric system. Uh, in fact, experimental system is not exactly spherically symmetric, but you can do the same thing in more complicated geometry. And um, uh, you can figure out something which is uh, very, very simple. If we, we know experimentally that we have telescopic contraction. So it turns out that to have telescopic contraction, what you need is um, for uh, active mice and stress to be proportional to uh, viscosity, right? So active stress as a function of density should be proportional to effective viscosity as a function of density. So this is the condition to have telescopic contraction. Why this is the case, we don't know. Uh, my favorite hypothesis is that the main cross-linker in this system is myosin itself. So uh, myosin is both generator of active contractile stress and of uh, passive cross-linking force. But many people probably disagree, so there could be different interpretations. But it's uh, kind of a cool puzzle for the future. And this bottom line will also be um, slightly important for the second interesting part. So what is this interesting part? The interesting part is that recently, uh, Kinneris and her people observed that uh, the contraction is not always uh, continuous, but it can be wavy. Uh, and the waves are uh, just obscenely periodic. It's almost like physics, not biology. So there's a very clear uh, period between the waves and the waves start closer to the periphery and contract to the, uh, to the center. Now, uh, the, the shape of the waves can uh, be a lot of fun to watch in different chemical conditions. For the sake of time, I'm not discussing those different biochemical conditions, but it's basically very reproducible phenomenon and many, many uh, uh, different biochemical conditions. So uh, we are not, of course, the first people who um, observed those waves. Just a couple of examples. There's a classical paper uh, from Mitchison uh, lab. Uh, what is shown at the top um, is uh, the gelation contraction uh, cycles in uh, also in cell extract. So what you see is Originally, you have this assembles mesh everywhere, it assembles and assembles, and then boom, it contracts. And then you have to wait for a long time again, it assembles and contracts. Uh, and very recently, there's this beautiful uh, uh, paper uh, where the system is extremely uh, similar to ours and observations are also extremely similar. There's this concentric shells of actin periodically contracting uh, to the center. And in fact, uh, so the, the emphasis of this recent paper wasn't to understand uh, really the mechanics of contraction. It was more on, on, on some other issues. I highly recommend to reading this paper if you're curious. But uh, one of the proposals in, in that paper was that uh, the mechanism of this contraction is uh, that this contracting Actomyosin shell is roughly like contractile ring in divided cells in cytokinesis. 
right? That makes sense. So you start with a shell, but um, it tries to contract. So of course it will symmetrically move uh, inward. So could it be the case? We have a uh, pretty elegant argument that it, this is not the case because uh, in Kernary lab, the experiment was done in flat geometry, not in uh, spherical geometry, just like capillary, flat capillary, and still there's this wave, suggesting that there's something between this crest of the wave, this dark thing you see, and the, uh, the wall to which the contraction is going. So we are against this model of contractility. Now, of course, the burning question is, when do you have continuous contraction and when do you have waves? And the answer is uh, uh, simple. And that's actually the, the great novel experimental result, uh, which this conclusion was not made before, though people uh, observed waves. So in small uh, droplets, uh, there, are, there is continuous contraction. In large droplets, there are waves. So what we have to explain is why is there a transition, size-dependent transition, from continuous contraction to uh, this uh, pulsatile periodic contraction. So uh, just one other beautiful control is, uh, well, what if uh, when the droplets are getting bigger and bigger, some concentration scales there. Let's say myosin concentration is disproportionately uh, growing in large droplets. Well, this observation uh, is against. So this shows uh, one of the rare cases when the center of contraction is not at the center, but closer to the sides. And then there's continuous contraction at the sides, at the side closer to the periphery and wavy contraction at the side, side, side far from the periphery. This is a strong argument that there's something mechanical going on. It's not some biochemical scale. And so finally, the model. Let's, look, let's try to build the model. So uh, all the elements of the model I already explained. There's, uh, well, first of all, uh, I'll show you the simplified 1D model. So it's basically uh, the model along a radial direction from the center to the periphery. A uh, multi-dimensional model, of course, would be much more complicated. So uh, X is just the direction from the center to the periphery, 1D direction. So we have conservation uh, equation, assembly, disassembly, drift with velocity U. Now velocity U we find from force balance equation. So uh, we have derivative of viscous, um, of viscous stress plus uh, active stress equal to zero. Now, all this is relatively trivial. The non-trivial thing which we are proposing is uh, non-trivial dependence of viscosity and contractile stress on the density. Uh, before I tell you what the simple math is, uh, let me tell you where we not invented it. We uh, took it from, um, a great review uh, by uh, Cohen, Drink, and Macintosh and uh, their people. And in fact, of course, this review is built on a multitude of uh, experimental and theoretical biophysical uh, papers that are really beautiful. So the bottom line of uh, those papers is this phase diagram, which shows you the material properties of the actin myosin mesh. And uh, I want to emphasize that the way I, I'm explaining this phase diagram is different from the way it's explained in this uh, review. So uh, like if I say something stupid or bizarre, don't hold it against the authors, it's me. So uh, my interpretation is the following. So we are in a two dimensional space. One of the coordinates is connectivity of the network, how connected it is uh, and um, we are interpreting it is that uh, actin de density is harbinger for connectivity. High density network is totally interconnected. Low density, it consists of unconnected clusters. And at some point there's percolation. Uh, another coordinate is contractility. Uh, in art and interpretation, it is myosin density. Okay, so it's basically 
how uh, intense is this contractile uh, stress. And we are making the super simplified assumption that we are living on uh, a straight line in this two dimensional parameter space Y, because we're assuming that myosin turn is turning over fast and the myosin density is slave to an actin density. So we are moving along actin density and uh, myosin density simply follows proportionally. Now, what's the structure of this phase diagram? Well, uh, we have uh, the uh, gas uh, phase, uh, meaning that there are uh, diffusing unconnected fragments of actin myosin. Each of those fragments are contractile, but the whole network is not contractile. So connectivity is too low, we have a gas. On the other hand, uh, if we move to the right, we go through the percolation point and we get a connected network, region two. Important thing that it's connected, but not contractile. Uh, why? Because we are in the region of low contractility. So high connectivity, low contractility, uh, not contractile connect connected network. We are interpreting, interpreting it as a passive viscous fluid. The, uh, those authors are, authors are preferring to treat it as elastic solid. In our case, it's not going to work. For us, only viscous fluid will work. And then if you move up from phase two to phase three, you have connected contractile fluid. This is fully blown active uh, viscous fluid. So mathematically, uh, we model this situation with the following two formula. Viscosity is zero if density is below percolation, percolation density, rho one, two. And above the percolation threshold, it's some function of rho. Contractile uh, stress is zero before contractility threshold, uh, this density rho to three, and function uh, of density, which is the same function of density with, this, with different factor in front as viscosity, okay? So this is our model, that's it, those three uh, equations. So uh, the only non-trivial thing uh, we are doing, and I will mention in a minute why we need it, is uh, that if you think about it, there will be a free boundary in this problem. This is uh, the boundary between connected chunk of the network and gas around. So what's happening at the boundary of the connected network? We are postulating that this boundary is growing with some velocity V0, which is a constant unknown parameter. This is as simple as individual actin filaments are polymerizing with some velocity V0. So imagine that this is the chunk of interconnected network moving to the left with velocity U, but the ends of the filaments sticking uh, outward are growing with velocity V0. So then the actual free boundary of the network uh, will be moving with velocity U plus V0. That's um, the thing we're postulating. I'll, I'll tell you in a minute why we need it. So uh, we solved numerically this system of equation, which is a relatively uh, trivial point, And indeed it predicts very nice uh, contractile, uh, contractile behavior. Uh, this is the um, predicted chemograph. Uh, I will show you uh, at the next um, uh, slide, the sequence of events. So what you see here is blue is the uh, density of actin, red is the velocity, uh, green line is the uh, gas connective state threshold, yellow line is connected contractile threshold. So let, let me explain what's happening here. Let's start here. So what you have here is a brief interval when previous uh, wave collapsed and the next one did not start yet. What's happening? The high density contractile network at the center contracting and velocity here, it's actually negative velocity, but we are showing it with opposite sign uh, is just linearly growing with distance for the reason that I already explained before. Then there's a region of uh, network which is connected, but not contractile. Here, the velocity is flat. 
it's non-zero, but it's not growing with distance. And then the velocity collapses to zero because this is the end of the interconnected network. This is uh, what, what you see here, for example, this is gas. And this is a connected, not contractile network, which regrew at the periphery of the droplet, right? Why this, this density profile? Well, because while the wave was retreating, the network started to regrow first at the periphery and later and later inward. So the uh, density regrows with this profile. So you wait a little bit, and of course, the density everywhere becomes interconnected. So then velocity suddenly jumps and you have the contraction starting. Then at some point, density will become higher than contractile and you have proper contractile band moving in and velocity then really jumps everywhere. And then the wave contracts inward and starts waiting for the new uh, wave, very simple. This explains why do we need this interesting free boundary condition? Because if we didn't allow the edge of the connected network to grow outward, it would keep retreating to the center. And so when the network retreats to the center, the gas density stays, keeps staying zero at the, at the boundary, near the boundary of the connected network. And then eventually, the density at the periphery of the droplet will exceed the contractile density and you will have two centers of contraction one at the center one at the periphery you will never get global contraction and this is um i am uh, kind of almost out of time but i wanted to emphasize that this is the biggest problem in this area of optimizing contraction how do we get global contraction it's very easy to get local chaotic contractions and very hard to get global contraction. Uh, so one uh, beautiful prediction of the model, which is pretty simple, is uh, that the waves happen within large droplets and in the and in uh, for very high contraction rate. Why is that? Very simple. Because um, see uh, to have to get rid of those waves when the when you when you're in a stationary position this boundary has to be closer to the droplet boundary but where is this boundary well it's contractile rate times the size of the uh, times this distance so kr right and it's stationary when this kr is equal to v0 so if this r is the size of the droplet your wave stops right near the boundary of the droplet and there will be no waves it will be stationary contraction so the transition happens at the size inversely proportional to the contract rate okay. and that's exactly what uh, experiment observes uh, and then another prediction which is rather trivial is the period of the waves well the period of course is of the order of uh, both contractile inverse contractile rate and inverse turnover rate for the new wave to start, you wait to rebuild the network and then it has to move in over time one over k, which doesn't depend on the size of the droplet, right? And the experiment kind of confirms this, uh, kind of because in some biochemical condition, there is actually some weak dependence on the size of the droplet at small sizes, which we don't completely understand. We have some ideas why that is, but not completely. So the last thing uh, that I want to show you is uh, what does the model say if we have the um, if we have the uh, connect connectivity threshold very close to the uh, connectivity threshold as here, then we cannot easily solve this continuous equation because as the uh, density approaches the connectivity threshold uh, at the center, at the periphery, it already exceeded contractility threshold. So we will have to solve much more complicated equations. We did that uh, using um, discrete analog of continuous model because continuous model then is becoming terribly uh, un unstable. And here's the result. In this case, what you see is this uh, elegant chemograph which shows you 
local contractile asters, right? So th those are local centers of contraction. And that's exactly what happens in experiment. If you choke the uh, droplet with a lot of capping uh, protein, because then actin filaments are becoming uh, really short. And then probably two things are happening. One is this V0 is becoming very tiny. And then uh, the contraction from global becomes local uh, and a couple of other things. So that's pretty much what I uh, wanted to tell you today. Um, again, uh, those are people who did it. Those are agencies that um, supported it. Uh, sorry, but I'm taking the money from the American army. Uh, and uh, um, as I said, there are many uh, open puzzles uh, in this area. And uh, of course, I kind of showed you the simple top of the iceberg. There's uh, this difficult uh, chunk of it underwater that I didn't have time uh, to show. Um, uh, I hope you'll be interested in those papers. Read it, email me, or answer the questions now. Thank you very much. Uh, should I? Yeah, Kayla, you should unmute yourself, I think, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, we have a lot of questions from the audience, so we'll uh, go through a few of them. Uh, from Robin Bruisma, um, he asked, uh, were the filaments allowed to cross each other during relaxation, I suppose in the simulation? Uh, in uh, that simulation, yes, yes, we allowed them to cross each other, which is bad. Um, in uh, like um, our excuse is that in that simulation we did, we uh, look what is actually happening with filaments and we um, deformed the network so little uh, and uh, diffu effective diffusion coefficient of filaments was so small that there were almost no actual crossing. But for more involved simulation, uh, this is something we have to correct and we are doing it. There's actually some software like a median, for example, that Gary Popayan did that uh, has this thing uh, that don't allow filaments to pass through each other. Um, a question from Deb Sankar is why in the small time scale uh, fixed uh, network, the mechanical behavior is not solid like? Uh, well, so uh, I didn't comment on the uh, magnitude of this uh, elastic and dashboard Element. So on a very uh, short time scale, uh, elastic um, elements is, uh, element is higher than uh, viscous, but there are always uh, some viscosity because viscosity at the short uh, time interval intervals is basically the viscosity of fluids with uh, actin filaments immersed in it. And there's, there are always some viscous elements, right? Uh, the, yeah, because short time, uh, short time scales is when you uh, deform um, the volume periodically with very high frequency, right? And uh, the, you always share it a bit. There always will be some viscosity. Okay. Um, Hinjal Daspiswas is asking about the reference for the model in the last part of the tutorial, the linear stability analysis. And one uh, linear stability analysis. That's a good one. It may not be actually published. So feel free to use those slides. I think I did it for, for some lecture a few years ago. Uh, or maybe somebody did that. I, uh, I, but I don't, I don't really know the reference. I, I kind of did it myself. A uh, question from Christoph Schmidt. Uh, would you predict pneumatic radial order of actin filaments on the basis of the telescopic model? Yeah, this is a great question. Uh, so in our simulations, we uh, very carefully uh, looked, uh, looked at the uh, geometric order and we never saw uh, pneumatic order. Uh, very likely for the reason is that we preferred to turn over the actin mesh relatively fast. So the filaments didn't have time to align. Uh, but if they are uh, more, uh, if there's more longevity, no doubt there'll be certain order. I, I don't, well, it, it's not gonna be as simple as pneumatics, but there, there will be some anisotropic mesh. I was thinking about the uh, contraction also in the, in the droplets. 
where it yeah, could, so yeah. um, in some conditions we certainly see the anisotropy. In other conditions, we don't. Uh, so, yeah, we didn't uh, we didn't look closely into that. I also I'm gonna say that. Uh, so we are dealing with um, the spatial scale of 100 micron, while individual filaments, of course, are probably like micron scale. So personally, I don't think it does matter much what the uh, like local order is, but of course, it does matter for for local contractility. But the, the point is that we didn't seriously look into it at all. Um, a question from Bekele Gurmesa. Is it known whether myosin acts as a static or dynamic uh, cross-linker? If dynamic, um, do we know the time scale? Yeah, so uh, yes, so it definitely acts uh, as a cross-linker in addition to being uh, a motor. Um, it's, uh, so the numbers are very complicated question and uh, I'm afraid I don't remember uh, those numbers by heart. But what, what I do remember is that um, the, there is a great dispersion in, uh, the, free, in the velocity with which mice and motors uh, effectively move. Well, not individual motors, but these bundles effectively move along a component. And simply this dispersion uh, makes them both contractile and uh, cross-linking elements. So the slow ones are effectively cross-linkers, the fast ones are effectively motors, uh, but the actual numbers for on and off and uh, other mechanical properties is a very murky issue. Um, a question from Saad Bamla. Um, what does gas mean in the context of the myosin contraction experiment? Do you mean you have a compressible fluid phase? Uh, so, so the beginning, I kind of missed. What does what mean? Um, what does uh, gas, the gas state? Oh, gas. Mean? So yeah, sorry. This uh, probably I said uh, this is one of the stupid things I say. It's simply unconnected uh, phase. Uh, it it simply means that you have um, unconnected chunks of uh, actin network diffusing in the cytoplasm, right? So uh, you, you, you just simply cannot have a coherent contraction because there's no physical overlap between actin filaments of this separate uh, chunk. G gas, I meant like each of this um, uh, actomizing asters is like a molecule of gas, like randomly moving around. I shouldn't call it gas. A question from Christoph again. Uh, do you get a prediction for centering for the centering force out of the model when fitting the experiments? For the centric force, uh, Christoph, you mean like the, the actual force of contraction? On the on the inclusion, you know, you have the garbage bag in the middle. So what's when when the garbage bag moves around, or if you say pull it away from the center, how what much how much force yeah, do you yeah, get? So uh, in um, it can be estimated from um, our e-life paper in 2020 because uh, uh, so there's this hydrodynamic estimate for this force. Um, you know, I'm, af af I'm afraid to be mistaken. Uh, it's better to look at this paper, but I vaguely remember that it's on the order of 100 picanewton or something like that. It's, uh, it's not a big force, 0.1 nanonewton. Um, we have uh, 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 from Greg Huber, he sent a few links uh, from Claire Waterman in Ted Salman's lab, uh, made the uh, well-known movies showing uh, slow radial inward drift in the outer parts of the living cells on time scales, yeah. very different from the one minute. Um, yeah, does yeah. This be so, yeah, yeah, that's uh, no, no doubt. As, as I said, there are many examples uh, other than three examples I showed in the beginning. And I, I know this uh, Claire Waterman's uh, study when they, they had those waves. Okay. And uh, one last question. Uh, do you think the asters construction, uh, contractions uh, could be analogous to the uh, medial clusters in epithelial cells, for example, during ventral furrowing? 
I have to plead ignorance on this one. I don't know. Uh, I will. I will look into it. Okay. I think this is all the questions. Um, we'll thank Alex again uh, for a wonderful talk. And if the audience has more questions, they're welcome to unmute themselves and ask. So thank you again, Alex, for the wonderful thanks, thanks, talk. Thank you very much, guys. I appreciate you being here. And Alex, we will send you all the questions that were asked in the chat. We will email you okay. that. And people, folks, please also feel free to email Alex directly. Like if you ask questions here, feel free to also email him directly after mm -hmm. this. Yeah. But we are happy to take more questions now. I'll uh, stop the recording, that's okay.